Matthew 16, verse 18, the Bible says, And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. The title for the sermon tonight is, I will build my church. Hey, who's going to build his church? Jesus Christ said, I will build my church. Okay, this is very important because you can build a church two ways. We see many churches today. There are a lot of churches today, right? But how many of them are actually built on the Lord Jesus Christ? Say, well, they're not. Well, if they're not built, built on the Lord Jesus Christ, what are they built upon? Well, we'll have a look at this later on. But let's start off with verse number one, Matthew 16, verse one. The Bible says, the Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. And that seems like a pretty nice request. You know, these guys come to Jesus. Can you show us a sign from heaven? Keep your finger there. Go back to Matthew chapter 12, please. Matthew chapter 12. I know we've covered this before, but just as a reminder, Matthew chapter 12, look at verse number 22. Okay, so it was the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to Christ. Matthew chapter 12, verse 22. The Bible says, Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. So you see Jesus Christ here performing an amazing miracle, isn't it? He heals someone from a, a, uh, from a devil there, right? In verse 23, And all the people were amazed and said, Is this not the son of David? So you see the people that saw the miracle of Christ, that saw the work of His hands, saying, This is the son of David. This is the Messiah. This is the promised one. But look at verse 24. But when the Pharisees heard it, uh, uh, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. So here we have the Pharisees once more. You can go back to Matthew 16 now, Matthew 16. So Jesus has already been doing miracles in their sight, hasn't he? He's been benefiting others that have been struggling with sicknesses, you know, casting out devils. The Pharisees are there. They've seen this. They've seen how the people reacted to Jesus. They saw, they knew this was the Christ. They saw the miracle. But here we are now, you know, four chapters later, they're saying, hey, show us a miracle. Show us a miracle. Do you think their hearts are in the right place? Do you think they really want to believe on Christ? No, they, they do not want that. They could have believed that. In fact, they said he cast out devils by the power of Beelzebub, which is the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, which means they cannot be forgiven anyway. What point is there for Jesus to show them a miracle when these people will not believe anyway? That these people are damned. These people that have blasphemed Jesus Christ or blasphemed the, the Holy Spirit, I should say, they're damned. You know, Jesus Christ is not going to perform a miracle for them. Verse number two. He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can, uh, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? So let's just understand this a little bit. Jesus Christ mentions twice in verse number 2 and then verse number 3 about the sky being red. Now just, just quickly, when does the sky turn red? It's during sunrise or sunset, right? That's when usually the sky is like that, that bright orange, that red, that purpley color sometimes that you see. Well, let's understand this then. When he says in verse number 2, uh, when it is evening, you say it'll be fair weather for the sky is red. So if it's evening, if evening's coming and the sky is red, what are we talking about here? The sun's setting, right? The sun is setting, the sky is turning red. And it says when you see that, you say it's going to be fair weather. Now let's understand this a little bit. Why would they say it's going to be good weather or fair weather? It's because if you can see the sky red, then it's not overcast. You know, it's not full of, full of clouds, so it's a clear sky, it's a clear night sky, it's turning to evening. These people can say, well, it's, it's going to be good weather tonight. Okay. Then in verse number 3, and in the morning, if it be foul weather, if the weather's going to be bad, if it's going to be you know, rainy or muggy or whatever, it says here, if it be foul weather today, for the sky is red, so the sky is red, and lowering. Okay, now here's a challenging thing. I looked up lowering in the, in the dictionary. What does lowering mean? You know what? There's, I couldn't find any dictionary that had the word lowering. But what I did find was that this, this word lowering is an archaic form of the word lowering. Okay, lowering. But 
we don't even use that so much today, right? Well, but what it basically means is that the sky has lowered, okay? The clouds have come down. So obviously when, when, the, when the sky is overcast, the clouds are a lot lower. When, it's, when, it's, when it feels like it's going to rain, the clouds are lower, they're heavier, you know, it might downpour. And so when they, when they see, yes, it's time for the sky to be red, but actually the sky is lowering, then they know, it says, oh, you, sorry, it says, uh, it will be foul weather. Say, hey, look, it's probably going to rain today, and it's not going to be a nice day today. So what Jesus is saying, look, you can look at the sky and you can work out by the clouds and how clear the sky is, you can work out how good the weather's going to be for that period of time. So, and then what this says, O ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but can you not discern the signs of the times? Okay, so what they couldn't understand, yes, these Pharisees can work out the weather, but what they've not worked out is that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, that he was the son of David. He was there already performing these miracles. And these Pharisees were so blinded, they had such a hatred, such an unbelief toward Jesus Christ, where they could not tell the times of the times. The Messiah was now walking on the earth. The Lord God, manifesting the flesh, was walking upon the earth. So you can see how blind these Pharisees, these Sadducees are. And this is what Jesus says about these blind Pharisees. Verse number four, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And he calls them wicked, he calls them adulterous. Now look, I think adultery is one of the worst sins. I mean, I'd put it up there. I mean, I'd rather, I'd rather be murdered by my wife than my wife commit adultery. That's kind of how I feel about it. I mean, adultery is such a wicked, wicked uh, a sin. But of course, Jesus Christ is, is using it here in a spiritual sense. You know, these Pharisees, they should have had the hearts of the Lord God. And if they had, if they believed the scriptures, they would have believed on Christ. But they had committed spiritual adultery. They had gone out after other gods or, or, or even just self, just made, made an image of themselves and worshipped themselves. That's why they're wicked and adulterous. It says, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, but there shall no sign be given unto it. No sign. How many people, when you go out soul winning, say to you, or I, I've had it said, man, if Jesus just appeared right now and did a miracle, I'll believe. No, Jesus says, hey, if you say that, that's a wicked and adulterous generation. Okay, they're not going to believe. You know, even if Jesus came and Jesus was there in the presence performing these miracles and people still did not believe on him. And then it says, but there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. So let's, what is the sign of Jonas? You know that Jonah was in the, in the whale's belly for how long? For three days and three nights. And what, why three days? Because he came out of the belly, uh, out of the, the whale's belly. Okay, he came out of the, the whale's belly. And he says, this is the sign that they're going to receive, the sign of Jonas. Obviously, we who have the whole Bible at our disposal, we know he's talking about his uh, death, burial for three days and three nights, and his resurrection. Hey, that's the sign that we need to go and preach the gospel with, okay? When we go, in fact, the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection. If someone says, hey, give me a sign, okay, let me show you the gospel. That's the sign. That's what uh, we need to preach, okay? That's, that's what we need to preach. If you could perform miracles, it's, it doesn't have the power. The power of salvation comes through the gospel, from people understanding what Jesus Christ could do for them. Verse number five, and when his disciples would come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Okay, so they needed bread for their journey. They forgot. Well, they maybe left it somewhere, forgot to purchase some, whatever. But if you guys have been here for the last two weeks, what have we learned? What did he do last week? You know, in chapter, what was it? Chapter 15. In chapter 15, he fed the 4,000. Remember that? They had no food. He fed the 4,000. In chapter 14, he fed the 5,000. And remember, these are just numbers of men. It doesn't include the numbers of women and children as well. So do you think that the disciples, after seeing these amazing miracles, should be concerned about bread? I mean, Jesus can provide for them supernaturally. God can provide them food, you know. They shouldn't be too concerned that they forgot bread. Yes, maybe a little bit irresponsible, but they should know by now, twice, that Jesus Christ is able to feed thousands on such little food, you know. But look at verse number six. Then Jesus said unto them, take heed, that means listen, and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So what is Jesus Christ speaking about here? Okay. He says, that doesn't, what, how does that make sense? Why is he talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Because we just found out these, this is a wicked and adulterous generation. Okay? You see, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, these are religious leaders. And they're also, their job is to feed the people. And what they're feeding is hypocrisy. What they're feeding people are false doctrines. And, and uh, Jesus is comparing their teachings, a spiritual lesson of bread, 
as leaven. You know what leaven is? It's like yeast. It, it leavens the whole bread. It, 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 uh, it spreads. We've got to be careful with false doctrine. If we don't shut it down, if we just accept false doctrine, it can spread into our lives, spread into our church, spread into our homes. We've got to be careful of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Let's keep reading verse number 7. And they, the disciples, reason amongst themselves, saying, Is it because we have taken no bread? Did Jesus say, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees because we forgot the bread? Is that what he's talking about? So, are the disciples understanding? It's, it's gone over the head, right? The spiritual lesson has gone over the head. Verse number 8. Uh, which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O oh, ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves? Because ye have brought no bread. Do you not yet understand? Neither remember the five loaves of the, of the 5,000 and how many baskets ye took up. It was 12 baskets then that were leftovers. Neither, verse number 10, neither the seven loaves of the 4,000 or how many baskets ye took up. There were seven baskets left for the 4,000. Verse number 11, how is it that ye do not understand that I spake not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? So you see, Jesus Christ, he is kind of rebuking his disciples. Can you not understand these spiritual lessons? Okay, now let me say something about us. We're all at different stages of our spiritual growth. Some of us have read the Bible more than others. And I've read the Bible a lot, but I still don't know, I still don't know everything in the Bible. I still don't have an answer for every verse. Okay, so I, the reason I bring this up to you, because these are people that are walking with Christ. They're seeing his miracles. They're listening to his preaching. They're, they've been doing this for three years, you know, pretty much full time at the feet of Jesus Christ, listening to him. And still, when Jesus Christ taught certain things, it was still difficult for them to understand. Okay, it's something still went over their heads. They couldn't fully uh, put it all together. Okay, and you know, the reason I say this, it, it should encourage you. Okay, sometimes when you read the Bible, you are going to struggle. You're just going to like, I don't know what that's saying. Well, you know what? If you don't know what it's saying, sometimes the disciples of Christ didn't understand either what Jesus Christ said. Okay? So that puts you in good company. It puts you in good company with these great men of God, okay, that struggle to understand certain sayings of Jesus Christ. But just because we don't understand, should we, should we just be like, well, okay, I'm not going to try to understand? No, Jesus Christ is, is instructing them and kind of rebuking them. Hey, why haven't you understood? You know, part of uh, growing as a Christian is reading the Word of God, studying the Word of God, meditating upon the Word of God, you know, uh, uh, memorizing the Word of God. The more time you spend with the Word, you know, the more you're going to understand it. The more you read through your Bible, the greater the truths are going to come to you. The deeper your understanding of the Word of God is going to become. We should study the Word of God as well. And, uh, you know, if you, if you struggle with certain passages, hey... You're just like everybody else, but ask God for wisdom. Ask God for understanding or seek, you know, your spiritual leaders, you know, your pastors or, or other good men that are in the church that you can trust their judgment. Hey, ask them about certain passages. I think that's, that's really fruitful when people can come together and discuss portions of scripture. So don't get discouraged if you don't understand. Keep trying. Jesus wants you to understand. God wants to give you the answers, okay? But little by little, okay? Line upon line, precept upon precept as we learn the word of God. Let's keep going. Verse number 12. Then, then understood, okay, once Jesus rebukes them, right, you think I'm talking about bread? <laughs> then understood they, how, uh, that he bade them not beware, sorry, that he, that he bade, uh, bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. See, that's what Jesus Christ was warning them on, of the doctrines, the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Because if you remember in verse number 15, when, when the Pharisees came to Jesus just, just last week, how they were criticizing him and his disciples for not washing their hands before they ate. And the Bible tells us that they were um, making for doctrines the commandments of men. They were making things, you know, uh, trying to force people to wash their hands as a doctrine of God, as a commandment of God, which is, which is it's not. Okay? And so we need to, this is, the, this is the, the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. People that teach things that are not in the Word of God. Okay? That's the leaven. And it can spread. We've got to be careful of false teaching all right and one thing i'll tell you guys right now something that's going to make your bible reading life a lot easier is get settled on the fundamentals of the faith just lock them in in your life you know salvation by grace through faith without works lock that in okay because then when you read a certain passage of the bible it, it sounds like this is saying i need works to be saved you'll be like no it's not because the fundamental of the faith is salvation by grace through faith so this must be teaching something else. If you just lock in the fundamentals, you're going to find your Bible reading a lot easier. 
Okay, and comparing scripture with scripture, another great task, another great tool, you know, uh, to use. But let me just really encourage you: if you haven't locked in your fundamentals, you better do that. You better do that. Who is Jesus Christ? The second person of the Trinity, the Son of God. We'll look at this later on. The Trinity, that's important. Okay, the virgin birth. You know, creation, six-day creation, that's all important. The second coming of Christ, lock all these things in, you know. Once you've got them locked in, the rest of the Bible is going to come to life for you. Let's keep reading. Verse number 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say, uh, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now, just for your information, Caesarea Philippi, if you remember Herod the Great, the one that tried to kill Jesus Christ when he was a little child, he, when he died, he had four sons, and the four sons basically took over his kingdom. And so the four sons had different areas of the kingdom. And one of the, guy, one of the sons' name was also Herod. Remember Herod, the one that beheaded John the Baptist? And why, why did he hate John the Baptist? Because, or why did his wife? Because he had taken the wife of his brother Philip. Remember? So Philip was another man, another man who, who reigned uh, after his father. And this is where we're at. This is, this is Philip's uh, area that, that, he looks after, that he looks over. It's called Caesarea, named after Caesar, and then Philippi, named after himself, Philip. Okay? So obviously his wife was taken by his brother, Herod. Just for your information, just thought that was interesting that Jesus Christ is in that area. Verse number 14. And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some say Elias, and others Jeremiah, and one of the prophets. So there are some people that believe you're just a prophet. You're one of these Old Testament prophets that come back from the dead, or you're just some other prophet, you know, some other prophet of God. And see, that's true. Jesus Christ was a prophet. But you see, even today, there are some religions that limit Jesus Christ to just a prophet. I mean, think of Islam. You know, think of the Muslims. They think of Jesus Christ. They don't believe he's the son of God. Obviously, they don't believe he's God manifest in the flesh. They believe he's just a good man, just a prophet. Hey, that's not enough for you to be saved. You need to know who Jesus Christ is. You must believe that he is the God, that he's the creator of all things, that he became manifest in the flesh as the son of God, that he lived a perfect life and died on the cross for us, you know, rose again from the dead. You know, it's not just knowing that Jesus was a good person. That's not enough to get you saved. There's a lot of religions in this world, a lot of religions in this world that believe Jesus Christ was a great prophet, a great man, a great teacher. Many of them, but none of them are saved. Okay, it's not enough to believe just that. Look at verse number 14, uh, 15, 15. And, he, and uh, he saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? Hey, this is a question we all at some point in our lives have to answer. All of us. Jesus Christ asked from all of us, God asked from all of us, but whom say ye that I am? Who is Jesus Christ to you? Okay, is he just a prophet, just a good man? What is he to you? How does Simon Peter answer? Verse number 16. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. You see what Peter says? He says, You're the Christ that makes you the Son of God, the Son of the living God. That's who Jesus Christ is. This is one of the fundamentals of the faith you have to lock in. Who is Jesus Christ? The Son of God. Okay? He's not God the Father. He's not the Holy Spirit. If you start doing that, you, you mess up the Trinity. You start messing up a, a fundamental doctrine, a huge problem. We see the testimony of Peter. You are the Son of the living God. And I'm just going to read some other passages Matthew 14, verse 33, it says, And uh, then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Hey, these disciples knew who Jesus Christ was, the Son of God. And of course, you know the story of Philip, you know, the evangelist, or the deacon, the evangelist as well, that, that, uh, that uh, preached the gospel to the Ethiopian eunuch. Remember that? And when the Ethiopian eunuch um, wants to get baptized, this gets said in Acts uh, chapter 8, verse 37. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Is there any doubt who the Bible tells us who Jesus Christ is? He's definitely here, the Son of God. Matthew 27, you guys are in Matthew, you can turn there if you want. Matthew 27, verse 54. Matthew 27, verse 54. This is Jesus Christ at his crucifixion. Now when the centurion and they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake 
And those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. You see how important we have multiple testimonies of Scripture. You know, every word should be established with two or three witnesses. So far, we've got more than that. Testifying of who Jesus Christ was, the Son of God. All right. I'll just keep, I'll read to you from John 1.34. And I saw, this is John speaking, and I saw and bear, bear record that this is the Son of God. That this is the Son of God. And John eleven twenty seven, 27, just quickly. She saith unto him, this is Martha, after her brother had passed away. After, you know, Lazarus, after, before Jesus Christ raises Lazarus from the dead. Uh, this is what Martha says to Jesus. She saith unto him, yea, Lord, I believe that thou art Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Any doubt of who Jesus Christ is? He's the Son of God. The Bible does not teach that He is God the Father. He is not the Holy Spirit, okay? This is a fundamental, guys. And I'm driving this home because many of you guys know where you guys have, some of you guys have come from. And some of the, 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 uh, the teaching, you know, the, the, some of the false teaching that, that makes Jesus into something that He is not. We've got to maintain what the Bible clearly tells us that Jesus is the Son of God. It doesn't tell us that He's God the Father, nor the Holy Spirit. Okay, He's the second person of the Trinity. Back to Matthew 16, please, verse 17. Matthew 16, verse 17. And Jesus answered, so after He says, You're the Son of God, answered and said unto Him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. Barjona is Simon's surname. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. You see, if you today know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you know who revealed that to you? The Father from heaven. Okay, It's a spiritual work, a spiritual knowledge that, has, that you've received from the Father to understand that Jesus is the Son of God. And it says in verse 18, And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So Jesus Christ says He's going to build His church, right? He's going to build it. But upon what? He said, upon this rock. Which rock? And this is where the Roman Catholics really mess it up, right? I mean, they mess it up. They see here, thou art Peter. And upon this rock, meaning they think upon the rock of Peter, they're going to, his, Jesus Christ is going to build his church, okay? Now, I'll tell you one major problem with that. Just um, drop down to verse number 23 quickly. Verse 23, same chapter. But he turned and said unto Peter, this is Jesus saying to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan! Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Man, if Jesus Christ is building his church on Simon Peter, it's already failed. I mean, in the same chapter, you see Satan already, you know, uh, 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 misleading Peter in his understanding. All right? So how do we understand this? What is the rock? Well, if Jesus said this to Peter... Surely Peter knows the answer, all right? Let's go, let's keep your finger there. Let's go to 1 Peter. Let's go to 1 Peter in our Bibles. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. So obviously, 1 Peter was written by the same Peter that Jesus Christ said these words to. So surely he knows who the rock is. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. Peter says, or writes, To whom coming as unto a living stone... This allowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up, at a, built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices accepted to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Hey, he, he believes in who? On Jesus Christ shall not be confounded, right? Verse 7, Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. So you see that uh, Peter here uh, writes about Jesus Christ, the one who he believed upon, and he calls him the stone. He calls him the rock. Okay? And of course, Jesus Christ is that rock in which this church is built upon. Okay? New Life Baptist Church is built upon, well, that's my desire, right? I wanted this church to be built upon Jesus Christ, 
That's the rock that will never move, all right? This church is not built on Pastor Kevin. This church is not built on one of you guys. This church is not built on some movement or some online preacher. No, this church is built on the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we make sure that this church remains built on Jesus Christ, then it's not going to fail, okay? It's not going to fail. You know, the only way this church can fail is if we just give up, you know, or that's it, okay? Because Jesus Christ is going to do his part. Jesus Christ is going to be our strong foundation. So let's, um, let's go back to uh, Matthew 16, verse 19. Actually, verse eight, go back to verse 18. I haven't finished what I wanted to say there. He says, upon this rock, upon the rock of Jesus Christ, he will build his church. And then it says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Okay. Now, there's a lot of false teaching about this. Okay. And um, let me just make this very clear. Uh, I've heard a lot of pastors, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to bag him out or anything. Okay. Because I think this is a common teaching about this. A lot of preachers say, well, see, when the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church, that's talking about the forces of Satan. You know, the forces of darkness will not take down or, or prevail or overcome the church of God. Is that really what it's saying? You know, what is hell? If you guys were here when I preached on hell, who, who owns hell? Is it Satan? No, it's God. God created hell, you know, for the punishment of the devil and his angels. Okay? God created hell. That's where he cast the unbeliever. Okay, God's in charge of hell, and one day Satan's going to be cast into the lake of fire, and he'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. Okay, it's not Satan tormenting uh, non-believers. Satan's the one that ultimately is the one that's going to be punished there in hell, and, and the, or not so much in hell, but he gets thrown into the lake of fire. Haven't got time to go through all of that right now. So if, if God owns hell, if God is the one who casts people into hell, which he does, there's plenty of scriptures about that, then what is it saying here? It says, let's read it again, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You see, the church is a local congregation of what? Believers. Okay, believers. We who have been saved, we who have trusted on the Lord Jesus Christ. And guess what? When you place your faith on Christ, you're given everlasting life. You're born of the Spirit. It's called everlasting for a reason. It's called eternal life for a reason. Why is that? Because it's, everlasting means it lasts forever. Eternal means it never ends. Once you're saved, once you've been purchased by the blood of, of Christ, you will never go to hell. Okay? You, you never have to have a fear of hell. That's why the gates of hell will not prevail against this church. Because if it's made up of local believers, that's what a church is supposed to be made of, of course the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. We've overcome hell. Because Jesus Christ overcame hell for us, right? He overcame death. He overcame sin. You know, he, you know we, we've uh, taken on His righteousness. You know, if we were to be cast into hell, then Jesus Christ did not complete what He was tasked to do. You know, Jesus Christ was the one who rose up from the dead. We'll look at this later on. That's why the gates of hell, we should have no fear of hell. You know, we should not be afraid that we will not make it to heaven if you've put all your faith and trust in Jesus Christ because it's Jesus that saves you. It's not yourself. It's not based on your works. It's based on what Jesus Christ has done for us. Verse number 19. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. All right, so Peter here, and of course by extension all of us, have been given the power to open the door of heaven. Okay? We, can, we actually have the power to prevent people from going to heaven or to go to heaven. Do you, you believe that? That's what he says. We're given the keys. Given the keys of heaven. What's that power? What, well, again, we just covered it, right? The gospel. The gospel message. That's the key to heaven. You know? And here's the problem. If we hold back those keys, if we don't open up those gates for others to come in, what are we doing? We're withholding people from going to heaven. Is that what your life wants? Is that what, how, what you want your life wants? You know, you want your life to be about, you know, someone that withheld heaven from others, or do you want to be someone that's known as opening, you know, opening up heaven, you know, um, loosen up uh, on earth, which and so people would be loosed up in heaven. Is that what you want to be known for? I hope, I hope the, the second one, right, being being loosed in heaven, opening that passage to heaven for other people. And again, the Roman Catholics they mess this up. Right. Have you guys seen the, the logo or the insignia of the Pope? It's like um, these two keys. Um, one's gold and one's silver. And um, they say, oh, like, you know, the, the Pope or the Roman Catholic Church, they've been given. Because they believe Peter was the first Pope. 
And so, you know, the church is built on the first pope. So, you know, the Roman Catholic Church is the one true church which has the keys to heaven. And that's why they, they believe that the only way for you to be saved, the only way for you to go to heaven, is through the Roman Catholic Church. Because the Roman Catholic Church, in their minds, has the keys to, to heaven. Okay? Now, here's the problem with that. Keep your finger there. Turn to Luke 11, verse 52. Luke 11, verse 52. Because this is not the only place that speaks of these keys. All right? Luke 11, verse 52. Luke 11, verse 52. And while you're reading there, Jesus Christ, during, during this chapter, I haven't got go, time to go through it all now, is destroying the religious leaders. Just absolutely wiping them in this chapter. Luke 11. But look at verse 52. Jesus says, Woe unto you lawyers, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in, ye hindered. You see, these lawyers, Jesus Christ says, Look, You've taken away the key, the key to enter. We see the context, you know, if you look at this chapter, is the kingdom of heaven, is the kingdom of God. They've taken, they've hidden that key away from other people. And it says, and them that were entering, ye hindered. There were certain people that wanted to know the truth. They wanted to know, what must I do to be saved? And these lawyers, these religious leaders stopped people from going into heaven. Hey, that's not what we want to be. We want to make sure that we're people that guide, you know, others to heaven, that we open up those, those gates, right? The, the gates of heaven through the keys of the gospel. So you see how here, the key of knowledge, you know, that's what we have. We have the key of knowledge. Okay, we have the gospel message. We can allow people to enter into heaven. Look, look at verse number 20. Back, sorry, uh, Matthew 16, verse 20. Matthew 16, verse 20. And before I go there, just obviously the Roman Catholic Church with their so-called keys, they're no different to these lawyers. They're no different hindering other people. They're not going in themselves. And they're hindering other people from coming into heaven. Verse number 20. Verse number 20. Uh, Matthew 16, verse 20. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Now, this is a really challenging verse to explain. I'll be honest with you. If you have your thoughts, please share it with me. I'll give you my best explanation. All right. So why would he tell his disciples to tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ? Isn't that what we, isn't that what we do? We go preach the gospel. We're telling, hey, this is the Messiah. This is the promised one. This is the Son of God. This is the one that died for your sins. He's the Christ. You know, so it's, it's a definitely a challenging verse to explain. But I think if we keep it within the context, we just keep it with what we've just learned. Okay? I think it starts to make a lot more sense. And so what I, what I, my best shot at this, if you guys have a better explanation, I, I'm, I'm happy to hear it, you know. But my best understanding of this, if you go back to verse number 17, just look back at verse 17. <clears throat> verse number 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon by Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, <clears throat> but my Father which is in heaven. So you see, <clears throat> Jesus says to Simon Peter that it was a spiritual awakening, a spiritual knowledge that came to him. The Father, the, the, you know, we'll say the Holy Ghost, because obviously when you believe the Holy Ghost, you know, um, you're born again through the Holy Ghost. Okay? It's a spiritual thing that takes place. It's not just a knowledge that you receive, but when you, when you do believe on Christ, it's also a spiritual awakening uh, for you. And so what I'm, what, from what I can understand here is that it looks like God the Father was doing work. You know, was working through the hearts of the people opening their eyes up to who Jesus Christ was. And of course, as Jesus Christ was going through and doing the great works, doing the great miracles, people were starting to realize, wow, this is Jesus. This is the Son of God. This is the Son of David. This is the Messiah. People are waking up to this truth. And it's almost like the work and the teaching of Jesus Christ was sufficient for the people in this area to, to know who He was. Okay? But of course, we have the Pharisees. We have the Sadducees. We have these other people that even seeing the great works of God, they still blinded their eyes. They, they still harden their hearts against Jesus Christ. So it seems like to me at this point in time, Jesus was just allowing people just to uh, look, watch, and, and come to their own understanding and realization of who Jesus Christ was. Okay? That's my best explanation. If you guys have something better, I'm happy to hear it. Verse 21. Verse 21. From that time forth, Jesus began to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. So Jesus Christ, he prophesied of his death and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Hey, this sounds nice. This sounds like Peter really wants to look after Jesus. Because Jesus said, look, I'm going to be killed. Peter says, no way. 
Sounds like Peter really cares for Jesus. But how does Jesus respond? Verse 23, But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an, thou art an offense unto me. You offend me, Peter. Wow. For thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So here's the thing that I, I believe what's going on here. It's not that, obviously, Satan is not trying to stop Jesus from, going, from being killed. In fact, there are other passages, I haven't got the passages with me, that basically say it was the forces of darkness that were involved in getting Jesus Christ killed and crucified. All right? So it wasn't like Satan was trying to stop that from happening. But I think Jesus nails it down uh, in the last verses, uh, words of verse 23. Uh, For thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So it appears to me that Simon Peter was tempted by Satan to have some great you know, ambitions in life. Maybe he wanted to be this great religious leader and he was looking at, at you know, the, the great success and the great you know, honor that he may receive as being a disciple of Christ. You know, he, he was seeking the things that be of men. He wasn't thinking about the things of God at this point in time in his life. Okay? Maybe he was thinking of himself too highly, you know, too highly. And the thought of Jesus dying would just shatter that dream. You know, if their great prophet, if their great preacher you know, were to die... You know, it'll destroy, as far as he's concerned, you know, the thoughts that maybe, you know, this is a great movement that we can achieve. But he doesn't realize that by his death, burial, and resurrection, the movement will grow greater. You know, there'll be greater works. The Holy Ghost will come and power these men and preach all across the world. You know, Simon Peter was not aware of that. And, and of course, we, we see this because when Jesus Christ was arrested and, and killed, we saw his disciples, we saw the apostles scattered and, and fearful for, for their own lives. So you see, um, that's what I believe what's going on here is that Peter may have thought too highly of himself, you know, thinking about this great, you know, uh, recognition that he's going to receive. And I think if you're ever going to be a pastor or just just get up and preach, you've got to just remember that the work that you do is is ministry. You're, You're ministering to the saints. Okay, it's not about elevating yourself. It's about elevating Jesus Christ. Okay, it's not about edifying yourself. It's about edifying the believers, you know, serving the believers, not about getting served, served yourself. It's about serving the believers with the Word of God. So make sure you keep that in mind, because I think when you start thinking too highly of yourself, you know, that's Satan, you know, tempting you, and you start to save, save the things of, of men rather than the things of God. Let's keep reading. Verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So I want you to notice this. He says it to his disciples, Okay. Um, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You don't know how many times I've heard, when I, when I, like, I knock the doors on Christian people, maybe you've heard this as well, and they say, you, know, you ask, well, what do you have to do to be saved? Has anyone, anyone ever said to you, take up your cross and follow after Christ? I've heard that a few times. Okay? So they've taken this verse about disciples, about discipleship, and they've applied this to salvation. Okay? Now think about this. If we're required to take up our cross, you know, to follow after Christ, you know, walk in His ways, to keep His commands, do the things that He's asking us to do, is that salvation by grace, through faith, or is that by works? It's definitely by works, right? And we'll see later on that Jesus does describe this as works. But let me tell you where a lot of uh, Christians mess this up, okay? Now, when you think of the word disciple, do you think of a saved person? Do you think of discipleship as salvation? Because I tell you now, a lot of churches teach that. Okay? A lot of Christians have this mixed up. Okay? Now, let me tell you why discipleship does not mean salvation necessarily. I mean, largely it does, but not necessarily. Okay? Because we know Judas Iscariot. Wasn't he a disciple of Christ? He was, right? But was he saved? No, he wasn't saved, right? So people, there's a lot of disciples of Jesus in this world, but they're not saved. Okay? Because they're still trusting in their works. They're trusting in the discipleship. They're following after Christ in order to be saved rather than his death, burial, and resurrection and the works fully done by, by Jesus Christ. Now, let me explain this to you. Keep your finger there. Go to Matthew 28, verse 19. Matthew 28, verse 19. I'm almost done now. But Matthew 28, verse 19. Let's read it together from the King James Bible. I'll just read it out. But it says here, Matthew 28, verse 19. Go ye therefore... And teach all nations. Is that difficult to understand? I'll go to all nations, right? And late, you know, it's preaching the gospel. Then baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. Now, keep your eyes in there, Matthew 28, verse 19. I'm going to read to you from the other four, the the four other main Bible English uh, Bible English translations, and let's have a look at the differences, okay? 
I'm going to read from the NIV, just the first few words. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Is that what your King James says? No, it says teach all nations. The new King James says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. The ESV, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. The New Living Translation, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. All right. Now, if we compare Scripture with Scripture, Jesus Christ also says, um, go ye into, the, into all the world and preach the gospel. Okay? Another time that he gives the Great Commission, preach the gospel. So when we compare Matthew 28 verse 19, it says, go ye therefore and teach all nations. What are you teaching all nations? You're preaching them the gospel. Okay? The gospel is the power unto God, power of God unto salvation. Okay? But what, does these, what do these modern versions say? What's salvation to them? Becoming a disciple. Okay? Works. Okay? This is why a lot of people get confused. They think in order for me to be saved, I have to become a disciple. No. You become saved by believing on Christ. Then once you believe, you can be a disciple. Okay? But there's another thing that I want you to understand. The word disciple is only in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then in the book of Acts. That's it. That the word disciple is not found in the epistles to the churches. Okay? Let me explain this very quickly. When Jesus Christ was on the earth, it was three years of his ministry, he was calling on people to leave their jobs. Remember? The fishermen left their boats. You know, Matthew the, um, or, or uh, uh, Levi, he left the table. You know, he's a tax collector, a publican. He left and followed after Christ. During those three years, Jesus Christ was calling on disciples because he was there for a limited time. He needed to teach these things so then these men would go out and become the spiritual leaders of the future churches to come, the future New Testament churches. All right? Now, I'm not saying we should, there, I'm not saying this has nothing to do with us, but what I'm saying is when Jesus Christ is speaking of disciples, he's speaking primarily about those that would leave all and follow after him. You see, today, we don't have Jesus Christ walking the earth. Okay? We don't have to leave all things and follow after Him okay, to learn other things. What does the Bible call the church, the local church? It calls it the body of Christ. Okay? If you want to be where the body of Christ is, then you've got to be at church. Gather with all the other believers. You make up the church. Okay? So we can take the principles of discipleship and apply that to our lives. We should follow after Christ. We should keep His commands. We should do the things that He's asked us to do. Right? Of course, we should strive to be a disciple in that sense. But we must always remember when we read the Bible, we, we keep the, the primary focus on discipleship to those that were there during that time of Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, let me just prove to you that this is works. Okay? Let's keep reading. Verse number 25. Matthew 16. Sorry. Matthew 16, verse 25. For whosoever will, uh, will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. So you might be thinking, this must be salvation. Oh, it's about discipleship, okay? So have a look at this. Let me just explain very quickly, all right? If you prioritize this life, okay? If you make, uh, you know, if you try to, to build all your goals and, and your, you know, your ambitions upon this world, you know, being rich, making money, all these things, you know, if you try to save your life here, then you're going to lose it. That's not lose your salvation. It's just that you're not going to have, you're not going to be able to take all the things that you've gained and earned on this earth into heaven. You're going to lose all those things, okay? But if you lose your life here, you put aside your ambitions to be this great, you know, rich man or whatever, you know, chasing after worldly things, worldly pleasures, and you put your sights on heaven, then you'll gain your life over there. That, that's where it matters. That's where your life will ha have e extreme value, okay? This is about prioritizing heavenly things versus earthly things. Verse 26, for what is a man profited that he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So we see in verse 26 that this is definitely a spiritual lesson that, God is, that Jesus Christ is teaching here. Now look, look at verse number 27. Let's keep this all together. Verse 27, for the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. This is his second coming. And then he shall reward every man according to his works. So what are the last few verses all about? Works. Discipleship. Okay. Is salvation by works? No. Okay. Be careful when you read the Bible. Don't take one verse and undo all the fundamental truths you already know. Keep it within the context. We see that Jesus Christ is very clearly speaking about his works. Should we have works? Absolutely. Should we trust our works for salvation? No, you've messed it up. As soon as you're trusting your works, you've lost the gospel message. Okay? But should we have works? 
Yes, that Jesus Christ wants us to have works. Yes, why? So then in verse 27, he can reward every man according to his works. I want to be rewarded by Jesus. I hope you have that desire, that you too want to be rewarded by Jesus, okay? How? By doing the works that he's given us. Verse 28, verse 28. Verily I say unto you, there, uh, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. I don't want to expand on that. I'll leave that for next week because I, I, I believe the answer to verse 28 is in the next chapter. We'll leave it there. Let's pray.